Good evening, everybody, and welcome. It's my pleasure um, to open our program tonight and welcome you uh, with Susan Glassman. Um, I'm co-president of Women's Voices Raised for Social Justice. I'm Ruth Arisman, and um, we're very happy to have you with us this evening. Women's Voice, just looking ahead, Women's Voices has uh, several education programs planned within the next couple of weeks. We have two lunch and learns on February 16th. We have um, a, a, a great program, I think, lined up with uh, a group from University City that's trying to assure that there's accessible, inclusive housing in University City is going to be speaking uh, from the Sustainable Housing and Equitable Development Group. So we hope you'll join us for that. And on March 3rd, a behavioral health response will be the subject of our Lunch and Learn and their efforts to partner with the St. Louis Police Department to make sure that when 911 calls are made, mental health professionals are available to respond and direct uh, those in need to, to services rather than sending them to hospitals and jails. So we, we hope you'll join us for those. Please check our website uh, for details. And we also on our website have a, a wealth of opportunities for you to take action. We're in the midst of our legislative session and um, there's action on many fronts that I think a lot of you will are concerned about and um, they need to hear from us. They need, uh, they need our voices and we hope that you'll take advantage of the opportunities that Women's Voices is offering. And we especially invite you, if you're not already a member, to become a member. Um, there is strength in numbers. Our voice is powerful when there are more of us standing together, and we hope that you'll join us. All that information is on our website, um, so, so please take advantage of that. So we're thrilled to have this um, th this really important program this evening. Nancy, uh, Nancy Litz has planned it, and she's going to introduce our speakers and uh, field questions afterwards. So I'll pass it off the baton to Nancy now. Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, to nobody's surprise, unfortunately, the Missouri legislature is at it again, considering a whole group of proposals to stigmatize transgender young people, everything from um, access to restrooms in their schools, um, the ability to participate on sports teams, and other proposals that would prohibit parents and um, physicians from supporting these vulnerable young people with very highly regarded and safe interventions. And the cumulative effect of all of that, of course, is to feed the growing prejudice and harassment of trans people all across our state. Our objective tonight is to empower our members and guests who are with us to be able to advocate both with your elected representatives and also simply to share accurate information with the people in your various circles of influence. We're excited to have three fabulous speakers tonight. Um, first, we'll hear from Dr. Christopher Lewis. Dr. Lewis is co-director of the Pediatric Transgender Health and also the director of the Differences in Sex Development Clinic at Washington University Med School of Medicine. He's received all kinds of awards for his work in this field um, from literally every LGBTQ organization that I'm aware of and a few I wasn't. Um, from the Human Rights Campaign, from Pride St. Louis, from out in St. Louis, um, and more recently, one of the Focus St. Louis's What's Right with the Region Award. Second, we'll hear from Samadhi Neomchai, who's the program director at the Transgender Center at St. Louis Children's Hospital, where he provides assistance for patients and families, particularly in navigating the school systems to meet the needs of transgender kids. 
Um, Samadhi has also worked in Jefferson City doing lobbying on various LGBTQ issues. And third, we'll hear from Rabbi Daniel Bogart, who is a co-rabbi at Central Reform Congregation here in St. Louis. That's a position that he shares with his wife, um, Karen, who is obviously also a rabbi. Um, rabbi Bogart is a native St. Louis and come home once again, and a lifelong advocacy involved in all kinds of causes, including in immigrant issues, living wage and common sense gun control. And he'll be sharing his personal story as the um, parent of a young transgender child and the adventures of advocating in the Missouri legislature. Um, so I'll turn it over first to Dr. Lewis. I thank you all for having me. Um, as uh, Nancy said, I'm the medical director of two specialty clinics at Washington University uh, at St. Louis Children's Hospital, one for transgender youth, and then also one for people who have differences of sex development. Uh, that is an another group of patients that people may know as intersex with the I and LGBTQIA. Um, and so those are people with medical conditions who are born neither entirely male or female in the uh, stereotypical definition of it. Um, I was asked as part of uh, my talk to y'all to sort of introduce the biological aspects of gender um, and to uh, discuss sort of how those things are thought of within the medical community. Uh, Nancy, is that something y'all want me to go into now or? That's perfect. I'll trust your judgment to run with it. Okay. Um, so a lot of people do talk about where does gender, the concept of gender come from, and people get the concepts of biological sex uh, frequently mixed up with uh, the definition of gender. Biological sex is a medical term that is defining sex based off of biological structures and anatomic uh, findings that involve the external and internal anatomy, as well as our genes, hormones, chromosomes, and other aspects of development. Um, gender is a separate concept that yes, may be associated with sex and may be influenced by those things that define someone's sex, but uh, it is a distinctly different concept that is more of an internal process of how one recognizes their gender on what most people would call as a male to female spectrum. Um, now that implies that people identify at the binary ends of that spectrum and people may identify within that spectrum or non-binary gender fluid individuals. And even then referring to it as a spectrum is not entirely accurate for everyone because some people do not identify as any gender and they identify as a gender. Um, or, or do not claim the, uh, the binary or the spectrum concepts. Uh, so it's important to sort of understand where people are coming from and try to meet them where they're at with their own terminology and understanding of who they are as well as society. Um, and things like gender are really based off of societal concepts. So there's absolutely nothing feminine about the color pink. There's nothing masculine about an ovoid pigskin ball. Um, but those things in our society are dictated as more masculine or feminine entities. Um, if you go back to 1800s London, most boys would be wearing pink and most girls would be wearing blue because of their cultural definitions of what uh, is masculine or feminine in those times. But when we're thinking about biological characteristics of humanity, Almost nothing is entirely one thing or the other, though we like to think that way. Short and tall, dark, uh, light, fat, skinny, or healthy, unhealthy. None of those things are really true concepts. There's all sorts of shades of gray in between. And same thing for biological sex. Um, and that and also goes into gender. So in my intersex or DSD clinic, we have individuals that are born with internal male structures, but external female structures, or they may have all the structures of a female, but have all the uh, genetics of a male. Um, and those things do play into role into how someone's gender identity develops. So gender identity is influenced by sex uh, chromosomes. It is influenced by hormones. 
Um, and it is influenced by external factors that we may or may not be able to control. There is not one single test, uh, question, brain scan, or anything I can do as a doctor to diagnose someone's gender. Um, really, that's only something that they can uh, understand themselves. So for, an ex for example, um, there is a condition called complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. Those are individuals that have male chromosomes, so XY, they have testicles and those testicles function and they make testosterone, but the receptor for testosterone does not uh, recognize testosterone. And so the body develops as if there's no testosterone around. And these individuals almost universally identify as female. They have normal external female anatomy. They lack a lot of the female internal structures for a variety of reasons I'm not gonna go into, but these individuals almost universally identify as female. Um, I have one patient that I know of that identifies as male in this uh, medical condition. There are other conditions where uh, hormones we know influence someone's gender identity. So we have individuals who have a condition called complete androgen instance, or uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And that's a condition where the adrenal glands make too much of, it, of quote unquote male hormones or androgens. And for individuals who are XX or stereotypical female chromosomes, the more severe in terms of uh, hormone levels that they make while being developed in the womb, they have a higher rate of identifying as male. Um, and so then there's another condition called colloquial extrophy, which has nothing to do with genes or chromosomes or hormones, but the body just doesn't develop normally. And so the inside organs like the bladder and sometimes intestines are born on the outside. And so for uh, persons who are XY or male karyotype, um, these individuals in the past were frequently turned into females um, because it's easier to, from a surgical standpoint to close the, the, that defect up and then to create that external anatomy. In the past, these people had those organs removed. And what we know nowadays is that over 60% of those individuals, despite having their testicles removed very early in their neonatal life and then raised as female, over half of them continue to identify as male. Um, and then there's that, but that means that an equally high percentage of 40% continue to identify as female. And then again, there's other uh, chromosomal and hormonal uh, conditions where people are, are born and raised as female, but then when they start to undergo puberty, they start to undergo a male quote unquote puberty. And those individuals also have higher rates of, of identifying as a gender different than the ones they were assigned at birth. So me going into all those medical conditions, how does that interplay with transgender identity? I think it just highlights that we don't know what causes someone to identify as the gender they identify as. And for me, that is of little value. Um, even if there was a gene or a hormonal environment or a certain set of characteristics or variables that would define someone's gender and we could test it and say this person's gonna identify as male or female or something else, that does not invalidate or validate that person's identity as they go through adolescence and into adulthood. And my job is just to support these individuals in the best way that I can. Would now be a reasonable time to delve just a tiny bit into um, some of the medical procedures that the legislature is looking to outlaw? Is that, does that- Yeah, I, I don't wanna take an important time away from Samadhi or, or Rabbi Daniel, but um, yes, I can definitely dump into those. So there is House Bill 2399 and House Bill 2649. And those House bills um, are trying to make it to where people cannot access care for transgender health purposes. Um, some of the, the verbiage in it makes it a little complicated to really understand when someone could access those services. But based off of my understanding, it would be after 18 years of age or once they're 18 years of age. And that can create a lot of uh, difficulty for people. And I'll let Samadhi go into more details about the psychosocial ramifications of it. 
But what that means is we would not be allowed to start people on pubertal suppression agents or on gender affirming hormone therapy until they've gone through a pr pretty significant portion of puberty that's associated with irreversible secondary sexual characteristics that can greatly impact someone's medical and mental health outcome and also force them to potentially undergo surgical interventions in the future that could have been prevented if we had been allowed to uh, put their puberty on pause to allow for more exploration of their gender, what their overall outcomes and goals are for themselves um, so that we can uh, take care of them as, as a society using the family, the any other loved ones that are important for the individual, the individual themselves, their medical team and their mental health team to all help to explore what should be the next, next best steps. Um, for pubertal suppression agents, these are medications that really put puberty on pause. Uh, they are given to young kids that are going through puberty too soon. So if I had a two-year-old that had a brain condition that caused them to go through puberty at a very young age, the same hormones and very similar doses that are weight-based would be given to that individual for almost a decade to put their puberty on pause until it's an appropriate time uh, for them to resume puberty. And we actually use these medications in cancer patients to preserve their fertility. So if you're an individual with ovaries who is undergoing chemotherapy or radiation, when we're undergoing those oncologic processes uh, for cancer treatment, the organs and cells in our body that are awake and active and doing things are the ones that are gonna take up those cancer drugs and get uh, damaged by them. So that's why we lose our hair. That's why we have skin problems, stomach problems, because all those act organs and cells are very active. And so in this situation, we'll use these exact same hormones to put their puberty on pause so that their ovaries in this hypothetical example is sort of dormant and not active and less likely to take up those cancer drugs. So we actually use it to preserve fertility in teenagers. Um, so why do I talk about those patient populations? And that's to highlight that this group of medications, pubertal suppression agents or puberty blockers as uh, called in the community, have no long-term health outcomes that uh, are irreversible as long as someone isn't going on to starting sex hormones from outside the body. When someone does go on to start estrogen or testosterone from outside the body, that's when irreversible changes come into play that we would need to have additional counseling and education on. Um, we do not start pubertal suppression agents until someone is in puberty. We do not start it on young kids who have not started puberty at all um, for transgender health purposes. And there's a, a very uh, extensive amount of eligibility and readiness criteria that are required before starting uh, even pubertal suppression agents, which are largely viewed as, an, as a reversible treatment. Um, when it comes to gender affirming hormones, which most people are gonna know as estrogen or testosterone, um, that is uh, something that does come into play when we're talking about irreversible changes, um, looking into things that affect fertility, bone health, cardiovascular health, things like that, that we educate families and individuals on and also have their own set of eligibility and readiness criteria. Um, but that is the uh, main area that you would then start to have some irreversible changes. Um, in terms of surgical interventions, um, that is generally not pursued until someone is 18 years of age or older. Now that is not, there are exceptions to that rule. Um, there are people who have on their own gone out and sought surgical interventions um, independent of the care that they see, receive with us. Um, but to highlight how that is also a health discrepancy, individuals who are cisgender male but have unwanted breast tissue, they can have breast removal surgery or gynecomastia uh, intervention um, before the age of 18. They can have it as young as 13, 14, 15, 16, as long as they meet certain weight criteria. And that's an irreversible change, some, changing something that is innate about their body. Um, individuals with a uh, large breast endowment can even go uh, breast reduction surgery before the age of 18. And then for patients who are intersex, uh, that patient population I was mentioning earlier, even that population, once they reach a level of maturity that they're able to be involved with their medical decision making, uh, they are also able to have surgical interventions to reduce clitoris, clitoris size 
or to change other aspects of their sexual anatomy, both internal and external, before the age of 18. Wow, that's, that's a lot to process. Thank you for taking us through that. Um, Samadhi, can we take it over to you? Sure, only if you can all pass the quiz that Dr. Lewis will send around, I'm kidding. Um, so my name is Samadhi, I'm the program manager of the Transgender Center. It's been about a year since I started. Prior to being at the Transgender Center, I was um, a lobbyist for Promo. I was the advocate in Jeff City every day during legislative session, which as you can imagine is exhausting. Um, and we faced down while I was there, um, and Daniel, Rabbi Daniel can attest to a lot of that, um, some of the worst attacks against LGBTQ folks in Missouri, at least legislatively. Um, like Dr. Lewis said, and like we talked about, there are bills trying to ban and criminalize perfectly safe, perfectly sound, reasonable medical care for transgender kids. Um, there are bills right now to ban transgender kids from playing on the sports team of their gender. Um, there are a couple of other bills about right to discriminate all over the place. Um, and on the front end, a lot of these bills are, I'll be polite since it's a large audience, are nonsense. Um, they're not really, they're, they're problem, there's, there's solutions in search of a problem. No one is forcing kids to, go, to undergo any type of gender affirming medical care that doesn't want it. And as Dr. Lewis said, like there, it is a process for, for young folks, folks under the age of 18, we need both parental consent. We need um, a, a letter of readiness from a therapist. And then you have to also make it and go to the, go to the doctor and do all that stuff. And then still, once, the, once Dr. Lewis and his colleagues have educated the patient and family about what, what, what the medications do and the patient's perhaps goals and desires, still kind of weighing like, if this is what they want, this is not what they want. No one is, this is not, no one is forcing anyone to do anything. And um, no, one that, no one is doing sur irreversible surgeries on trans kids that we refer to. That's not happening either. That is definitely not happening in some kind of like sneaky underground, like forcing children to do that. That's not happening. Um, and as for the trans athlete ban, so um, these bills are talked about a lot. They pass in a couple of states, unfortunately. They've all passed during COVID, which I think is kind of a symbol of other problems. Like we clearly have other real world problems that COVID, COVID itself is one of them and has demonstrated others. None of these things, like transgender athletes playing on sports teams um, isn't like, that's not a problem. <laughs> it's not a problem. Um, so, but when these bills pass, as they're discussed, as they're debated, as really problematic and hurtful things are said in the legislature, are quoted you know, at, the, at the dinner table, at school, around other parents, like th these are harmful. Um, I was speaking to someone earlier today who um, was talking about, actually I think, I think, I was speaking to Danielle Spradley earlier, uh, Rabbi Daniel, and I think she was talking about like, uh, one of our families has one of the families that I've worked with has, has spent a lot of time talking to a state representative about how these bills are harmful. And she was just like, no, I'm not, I'm not hurting anyone. And it's, it's it like to say that is such a gross, a gross misunderstanding of what this is. Like these, for a lot of the legislators, like the idea of knowing a trans person or the trans person being real is like, a foreign concept. It is. It is not real, um, but it is real. Like lot, and I feel learning that about our lovely elected officials in Jeff City. Um, I, I, lots of my friends. I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this as like a flex or to show off. But like, I have a lot of friends who are transgender, who are non-binary, um, and I feel truly sad that lots of folks don't know a trans person for real and then they feel that they have some kind of a right or justification to pass legislation that explicitly targets them and harms them like that that's levels of unacceptable so the medical care bans 
like, sure, a lot of these kids can, could and may have to wait until they're 18, regardless of the legislation. But a lot of our kids, a lot of our patients that are ready, that have parental support, that have worked so hard to like work with their families, to get mom, get both parents, all parents to like accept them and understand them, to then have someone in Jeff City who has no idea what this process is or who they are to say, no, no, what your family and what you've decided for yourself and what the doctor has decided for yourself is incorrect. It's that's inconscionable and it's harmful. And um, I don't think Dr. Lewis mentioned like, and I've seen this with adult friends of mine who are transgender. I've seen this with a lot of our patients when they start hormones, when they when they get that affirmation that they need from the medicine that the, that is provided. It's life affirming is like the best way to describe that. And it is, it is incredible to see the positive effect that these have, these have. And like to say that, like, oh, these are harmful. As Dr. Lewis said, like, we do, we do this kind of care for other things anyway. It's not, we're not experimenting on children, that that's not what's happening. So, um, and to have us have to come back to Jeff City year after year and just be ignored <laughs> when like, there's, we have a lot of other real issues to address in, in, in legislation and not, this is not one of them. Um, and, you know, I, Daniel was one of our many calmer parents, but a lot of the parents that testified were very agitated and very frustrated, justifiably so. I don't have children of my own, but if I had gone on this journey with my child and my family about from like, maybe not so accepting to accepting to like, We've come to like Dr. Lewis's office for care and then to have to come to Jeff City and basically talk to a brick wall about how like this is, this process is irrelevant. Like that's incredibly damaging and hurtful. Um, and I think it sends a really bad message to kids when, who are already vulnerable, who have already experienced trauma, who have already experienced um, rejection, maybe from peers, maybe from other family to have to go to like the center of government to have to defend who they are like that. Like this is when people don't want to listen to them or don't want to hear them out. Um, and that kind of transitions me into, I want to try to listen to like some of the athlete band stuff. Um, and I, I am not a sports person. I tell my patients this when I ask, when I ask them about sports, like I, I am 5'11 and I appear to be athletic. I cannot throw, catch, run for any long period of time. It, a ball or puck if it's thrown at me. And I am for all intents and purposes like a cisgender man. And um, Dr. Lewis has heard me say this with several patients, despite the like testosterone, like coursing through my veins, like I'm not good at sports. No, like that's not gonna get better anytime soon. I also have other things to do. Um, but there's this notion that women's sports is under attack because trans girls are joining are playing like are playing on girls' teams and like taking away opportunities for cisgender girls. And that that is just not true. Like that is not what's happening. Um, when I one of the things that I talked about with a lot of our legislators, and I say this all the time, okay, no one in my circle of peers argues with me because they know that they would get a stern talking to you. But um, the International Olympic Committee has allowed transgender people to play on the team of their gender. So like Dr. Lewis said, not their sex assigned at birth, but the gender that they are um, on, for like a decade. The NCAA has had the same policy. And I feel like none of us can really, without thinking too hard about it, can name like a transgender like NCAA champion or like a transgender gold medalist from anywhere. And, the, and that if you look, if you consider that sample size, first of all, the International Olympics is like, everyone on the planet competing at their best, best of the best in every country. And then you have the NCAA, which is like also like the best of the best. None of this isn't, this isn't like an, epi an epidemic or like a crisis. This isn't, again, this is another solution in search of a problem. And there's a lot of harm in telling a transgender boy that they should play on the girls team or use the girls restroom, or they're not really a boy as there is this, you know, and vice versa, as saying a transgender girl is really a boy, can't use the girl's room, has to play on the girl's team, like that, on the boy's team, like that's not what this is. And this is not, I, I enjoyed when we testified on these bills and people asked the 
the bill sponsor, like, where is this happening in Missouri? And the answer was, it's not. Like, there isn't. Yes, there are trans kids playing on, on playing sports teams. Great. But this isn't like a crisis. There isn't, this doesn't require legislation. And it's LGBTQ folks, kids, it's well noted like gym class and PE and sports is like not happy fun times. It is where we get bullied the most, it is where we are targeted for harassment like locker room stuff that happens is like also like the gym teacher can be hostile. So there's lots of that unfortunate cultural stuff happens. So if a trans boy is like, you know what, in spite of all of that, <laughs> I really want to join the track team, like good for him. And that's awesome. And that's amazing. And like, same for every trans athlete who wants to compete, like that's awesome. But then to say, no, you can't, like that's not okay. And that's, that, that is saying trans people don't belong. If, we, if trans people can't participate in every aspect of society that everyone else is allowed to at least try out for or engage in, this is saying that trans folks are not equal. And that's, to send that message to children is a real problem. And this was what one of the state reps would always tell me, like, well, when my daughter goes to play softball in college, like she deserves a fair shot. Well, like, if the NCAA has policies that include transgender athletes, she's going to play against, in theory, trans girls on her team or on other teams. So like banning it in high school doesn't really like change the equation. Not saying we should ban it at the college level either. The goal is to not do any of it. But these are problems and these are solutions in search of problems. And they're not just theoretical. They're not just like ideas that we have throwing around, these hurt people, they scare people. Um, when, I started, when I started at the Transgender Center last year, every one of the patients that I talked to about school stuff would end up asking about policy and mom, the parents. And the, the parents were very afraid that, like what happens if the legislature passes a bill? And here they are sitting in our doctor's office, like you know, their child's on hormone replacement or puberty blockers and they're afraid. And that's not what our government should be doing. The gov our government should not be targeting children, especially a very small, already underrepresented and already targeted set of children with legislation that is baseless and um, problematic. And it, one thing it does affect, and this is more of like a bigger picture thing, it does affect who stays and who goes in misery. A lot of these trans kids aren't gonna, are gonna go to college and not come back. A lot of these LGBTQ kids are gonna go and not come back. A lot of trans folks aren't gonna come here. A lot of LGBTQ folks aren't gonna come here because like we keep trying to, the polite word I say is like do shenanigans in the legislature that target it like, frankly makes us seem backwards and also again is really harmful. Um, I feel like I took a lot of time there rambling, but I hope that was helpful. Um, the two things I could encourage us to do, which I'm sure that we'll get to Q and A later, um, do your best if you can take action against these bills, call your state legislature and Senator and tell them these have to stop. Um, and definitely um, seek out and learn about and seek out the voices of trans folks that these bills affect, both adults and kids, because um, that's who can tell you the most and the best, like what matters and what's important to them. Thank, thank you so much, Samadhi. I'm sorry, I was just um, just checking, simultaneously checking the chat. Um, but why don't we go ahead and hear from Rabbi Bogart, and um, and then we'll back up and and revisit the questions there. Thank you. Rabbi Bogart. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to be with you. Good to see faces and so many familiar names out there. Uh, so I, I actually want to start, I hope you'll forgive me, Nancy. I'm going to take a few minutes for this. Uh, I want to start by telling a little bit of a story. Uh, are people familiar with the Jewish Daily Forward? It's still a newspaper. In fact, I wrote an op-ed for it like two weeks ago. It's still a thing. You can go to forward.com and find the same newspaper. Uh, so there's a letter to the editor in the Jewish Daily Forward in the 1930s that I want to talk about. Because 
evidently it was a whole thing. The press was up in a tizzy because all of these athletes were going off. It was during the Nazi Olympics and all these athletes were going off and competing in the women's games and coming home as men. And so there was all this uproar in the press and uh, in old by that time, a uh, Jewish immigrant, uh, Yiddish speaking immigrant living in Brooklyn writes a letter to the Daily Forward because he says, you crazy people, remember this is the 1930s, you think this whole trans thing is new. It's a, it's a fad sweeping the nation. You may be familiar with this kind of language, right? We hear it today. Uh, he says, let me tell you a story about the shtetl back home in the old country. And he proceeds to tell this gorgeous story about someone who was raised uh, as a woman, raised as Bela, uh, who leaves the shtetl at the age of 23, uh, who goes and finds a gender affirming uh, professor at the university, who comes back as Beryl, a new name to the same community, uh, who comes into the shtetl and is accepted and embraced and who the men of the community teach to lead the prayers, lead the davening, because this would have been a time, right, when only men would have been allowed to do that, who gets married by the rabbi to an old girlfriend, Rachel. And th this man, Yeshai is his name, who's writing this letter to the Daily Forward, says, uh, he ends by saying, in, in our town, Beryl always had a good name for himself. So I... I always love starting with that story. I was so grateful when I, when I found that story, right? The, the, these ancient stories of queer ancestors, trans ancestors for my kid. Um, I remember being taught that story and breaking into tears when I first heard it. Uh, but I mention it because I think it's really important that we understand that being trans isn't something that's new to the human experience or new to this moment today or new to Jewish community. I, I also wanna suggest that like, being radically accepting of trans folk is also not new to Jewish community. Uh, uh, I know this is not an overtly Jewish group, but I, I know many of you uh, uh, from the Jewish world. Uh, so I always think it's important to start there, to start with a little bit of history, a little bit of past. And now I'm gonna tell you some of my story. Um, and the reality is I'm gonna share what's really not my story, it's my son's story. And I'm gonna be sharing vulnerable, intimate details about an eight-year-old. And I, I, just, I just wanna hold on to the fact that no one should have to do this. And that the reason that I am telling these stories, first of all, I ask my eight-year-old before I do any of this. Um, but the reason I tell these stories is because my child is openly accepted and loved and embraced at his school where they threw a party for him on the one year anniversary of his transition with uh, 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 icing and cupcakes in the color of the trans flag and his ra rabbi at school knit him a kippah, which is right, a traditionally male object and the trans flag, I, right, an amazing place. My kid is embraced uh, at his synagogue. He's embraced by his family. And yet I am here sharing these intimate vulnerable details because the bigots and bullies in the Jeff City Legislature are coming after my family. And this is the only thing I know how, this is the only thing I know what to do. I, I don't know what else to do to protect my family. Um, so I just, I wanna start with that because I think it's really important to set the stage that, that even sharing these details is a violation um, that family shouldn't have to do. Uh, I know Samati spoke beautifully about what it's like to go down to Jeff City. It, it, this too is a violation. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my son, uh, my amazing son, one of my three amazing children. Uh, when he was about three and a half, I remember it so vividly. Uh, I was putting him to bed and I was reading him a bedtime story and he stops me and he goes, daddy, do you think God could make me over again as a boy? I remember going um, back to my wife, to Karen, and looking at her and saying, we're either going to remember this conversation for a very long time or we're not going to remember it at all. Um, uh, I don't think I slept much that night, actually. Uh, every time he had a choice from the moment he could choose, he chose boys' clothing. He only wanted to dress like a boy. He 
in particular, only wanted to wear boys underwear. Uh, the biggest battles we had, the biggest battles we had, uh, now we're talking about a four or five year old, uh, was when he'd be forced to wear a dress for, you know, grandma, great grandma's 90th birthday. That was, that, that's a little infamous in our house actually these days. Um, so it didn't come as a surprise at all. He'd been asking for a shorter and shorter haircut over time. And right before the pandemic, uh, it was January, 2020, uh, he finally got a short haircut, what he called a boy's haircut, and he got the haircut, and he turned to us immediately after he got it, and he said, okay, I'm a boy now, and that was it, that was it for as far as he was concerned, in fact, he said he was only going to, we're just going to try it at home, and then he said, well, but I might tell one of my friends, so I got a call from like every single teacher the next day, oh my god, your child came to me and told me that he has a secret that he wants to tell me and only me, and but evidently he went around and told everyone the secret. Um, he came to us, uh, uh, two days before, actually it was the day of lockdown. We had pulled the kids out of school a day early so that, you know, we could get over the hump. Hopefully coronavirus would be gone by that weekend, I guess was right. our logic back in March of 2020. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, he came to us and he told me the new name that he wanted to be called. And I, I will always remember it because my very first thought was God, that name fits you so much better than your old name ever did. Um, my son doesn't go to a gender affirming therapist or a counselor uh, because he doesn't need one. Because right now in his life, this is not a medical condition and it's not a mental health condition and it's not a condition. It's just, this is who he is and he's thriving, and he's brilliant, and he's a pain in the tuchus. Oh my God, is he a pain in the tuchus? But like none of that has anything to do with him being trans. And I think, you know, this year for testimony, when we're going down, his kindergarten teacher, um, Maura Felicia, if anyone knows any of the Merowitz teachers, she's, she's magical. Uh, but Felicia's gonna come down and testify because these teachers, they see it. They see these kids and they see them living themselves and they see that this is not right, like an act or this is not a phase or this is not a anything in, in that this isn't something traumatic except for the trauma that our society places on these human beings. Uh, I, I assume folks have seen the suicide rates amongst trans youth, particularly trans teens you know what makes that suicide rate go down to almost the same as cis kids? Cis, by the way, is the sort of, if, if your gender identity matches your sort of stereotypical sex, you're called cis as opposed to being trans, right? Um, the, the thing that reduces it almost to the rate of cis kids is if there is one loving, affirming adult in their life. Um, I, I, I can't say that without crying a little because um, think about what that means for how many of these kids don't have a loving, affirming adult in their life. And I think that's the undercurrent of why these bills like the athlete bill, the, 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 the trans athlete ban are so awful. It's because they get otherwise good, wonderful, compassionate people to start having conversations in public just for the sake of having conversations about the humanity of my child and of other trans kids who are amongst the most bullied children in the world. My, my kid lives in a bubble. I mean it I, in my goal. <laughs> I never thought I would say this as a parent. My goal is absolutely to keep him in that bubble as long as I can. It's, that's not my general parenting style, but right. Um, the only bullies in his life are in the Missouri State Legislature. So uh, I don't want to take up too much more time. I'm sure there's a ton of questions, but Really, thank you all for being here. It really means a lot. I, the other thing I think is really important, and Samati uh, said something like this too, is listen to trans voices. 
listen to the voices of trans adults, and in particular, listen to the voices of folks who have experienced this, who can talk about what it's like to be openly accepted and what it's like to grow up not being openly accepted. The, I guess the last thing I'll say is everyone here knows a trans person. I guarantee you. Because one of the things that's happened to me in life since I became openly and actively a voice for protecting trans kids is I have had so many people that I have known throughout my life come and send me a message and say, you know, you are one of five people who I'm telling you this to. Pastors in churches who would be fired. Uh, friends from college, friends from preschool. Uh, everyone here knows someone who's trans. The question is, have you made it clear that you're a safe person to be themselves too? So thank you, everyone. Oh, I keep saying it's the last thing. I'm going to give one more plug. Campindigopoint.org. It's our new camp. I started it, uh, or we're starting it uh, with a group of friends. We're all camp friends uh, from childhood. Shira Berkowitz, who works at Promo. Uh, Zoe Fleischer, who's Randy Fleischer's child. Um, all, all dear lifelong relationships. That is uh, a week-long sleepaway camp for transgender expansive and LGBTQ youth. Uh, second through 11th grades. I, I believe it. we are going to save lives with archery mm -hmm. and swimming and queer community. Every counselor is gonna be a part of the LGBTQ community. I, I'm literally gonna be the only cishet person at the, uh, that's cisgendered heterosexual uh, uh, person there. We dreamed this up two months ago and we have 70 kids who are coming from all over the country. Uh, so we've committed that we will there, there is no financial barrier that will keep a kid from coming to camp. Uh, so my last plug is, uh, if you'd like to donate, uh, head to uh, campindigopoint.org. It costs $575 uh, to send a kid to camp. Thanks to the good folks at Camp Manitoba, by the way, who, who uh, are making this happen. So thank you. I'm sorry to take up so much time. Absolutely no apology required. And giving us an additional way to be supportive um, in addition to hopefully everyone is going to be reaching out to their legislators. Um, one thing we haven't touched on in this conversation that might be um, meaningful for some of our audience is the issue of pronouns. Can one of you just speak briefly to that? What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I mean, just, just how to go about why it's important to understand pronouns, why um, sharing one's own pronouns is a door opener, and, and some of the variety of pronouns that people are, um, are claiming. Oh. Okay, um, I can take that. I do so. I do the I do a lot of trainings for schools and like school-based like groups. Like I'm doing a training for an after-school program in a couple of weeks on like not, not 101, but like some some fundamentals, like some of the stuff that Dr. Lewis went over. Um, and it, pronouns is a big question. So um, pronouns are in my signature. They're in Dr. Lewis's signature. They're in Daniel's signature or not signature Zoom username. Some of us also have it in our signatures when we send an email. This, well, I include it in my signature because frequently I get misgendered a lot, which is a whole other conversation for another time. Um, but introducing yourself with your pronouns, confirming or asking someone what their pronouns are, and then introducing yourself with your pronouns gives the opportunity for someone else whose pronouns may not be as obvious as, as one would think they are to use their pronouns that they would want, especially, not especially, but for someone who's non-binary and uses they, them pronouns, that can give a, a door for them to introduce themselves with their pronouns. Um, yeah. Um, pronouns can be, pronouns can seem kind of like a sticky thing, but it's important to validate who people are and support who they are in a very simple way, in a very small way. Um, by using the pronouns they want to go by and then respecting the pronouns they ask you to refer them to. Mistakes will happen. Um, 
we're only human. Best foot forward is at least, you know, good faith effort. It's helpful. And several studies on that just like parental and familial support uh, show that uh, they normalize rates of suicide, depression, anxiety, um, societal use of someone's pronouns, which is showing respect for their dignity as a human and autonomy as an individual also helps to improve those medical and mental health outcomes. I just want to throw out one more piece too, that at least has been helpful to us, uh, that if you have someone in your life who has transition pronouns, uh, I find it really helpful to practice when they're not around practice talking about them when they were a baby with their new pronouns, talk about when, you know, they'll be old with their pronouns, what, what they're doing, now, right? The, the various tenses I find helpful. Similarly, I know a lot of folks uh, struggle with using they, them pronouns for a person. Um, so here's my tip for folks trying to uh, be respectful and use they, them pronouns for someone. Uh, think about the new doctor who you're going to next week. You don't know the doctor's gender, but you know that you're going to go see them and you know that they're going to treat you well. And you know that if you have any prescription needs, they're going to write you a prescription, right? You'll notice that I just used they, them that entire time and no one was confused about who I was talking to. Um, I think actually that reinforces how silly it is, this whole like gender in our language thing sometimes, um, right? When, when you see that, right? Why is that so necessary to that conversation at all anyhow? Um, so yeah, those are my tips. One other quick thing about pronouns that um, I saw in an email communication from someone to me and promptly copied, um, but this person included her, her, it was a cis woman, um, but she included her pronouns in her email signature. And the after her pronouns, she had written the word why and made it into a link which linked to the website mypronouns.org, um, which allowed anyone who spotted that in her email to learn a little bit more about the issue. And I found since I've started doing that, two different things have happened. Once, one is that I've had a number of people that I was corresponding with in my business life um, reach back out and say how much it meant to them to realize that maybe somebody, random person out there understood. And I've had people push back on it and you know say that I'm being too PC or whatever, which actually then opened the door for some really wonderful conversations. So it's an easy way to sort of put a toe in the water about being an advocate. The, that website again is just mypronouns.org. Um, Another question that um, has been sort of touched on is talking about the fact that families with transgender kids and certainly transgender adults as well might be prompted to literally leave the area or never come here in the first place um, because of some of these backward looking proposals, which causes me to wonder if um, the corporate community or others who care about um, workforce development have taken any interest in that, that issue? Uh, I can't speak to current promo activities, but I know that when we were working on a business coalition when I was there, and there were several, um, at least regional chambers of commerce at the St. Louis Chamber and the Kansas City Chamber who had at least tried or spoken out against these bills. Um, a lot of, at least on a national level, a lot of organizations are pushing the NCAA to make a statement about the athlete bans. Um, a few years back, North Carolina, I forget which Carolina it was, I should probably remember that. Um, one of the Carolinas tried to ban like trans people from using the, rent, the correct restroom. And the NCAA was like, if you do that, and they did, we are pulling our championship event out of your state entirely. And that caught that has a huge economic impact. Um, so if they made a statement about these really bad athlete bands, that would also that have an impact in two ways. One, like the same impact it had in the Carolinas, but also like as a large organization that talked that like does the athlete stuff, we're telling you these bills are 
these bills are stupid, don't do that. And like, we will, we will follow that through with action. So um, some businesses and some chambers of commerce do get involved in opposing a lot of these bills. So, but it's a little more difficult to make that, to make that link to um, taking more active, more, more energetic steps in helping us stop them. Um, so I wonder, are you also following these bills as they're progressing in Jeff City? Can you let us know how we can know committee participants who are mm -hmm. moving them out of committee or how else can we interject our voices? Yeah, um, I'll give you a couple, I'll give a couple of tools. So I would recommend that you follow promos action. So the website is promoonline.org and you follow up with the ACLU of Missouri, they are both working against these bills as hard as they can. Um, they send out pretty regular updates. They will text you or email you when like action needs to be taken. Um, another website that I use, I'm using it now, uh, is called fastdemocracy.com. And they, it's a pretty efficient, effective like bill tracker. Um, it, you, know, you can look up bills by topic, by state, by, you know, if they're at the federal level, um, but they, so I, I'm tracking a few different things um, and it, 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 I get a weekly, I get a daily email saying this bill is in committee, this bill has been referred to this committee. Um, you can also manually track them if you want and you can go to house.mo.gov or senate.mo.gov, look up the bill number directly and that will at least give you um, who's on that committee. Um, not a big surprise. Most of the blue parts of the state are strongly opposed to these bills. So it can feel like a little bit of preaching to the choir, um, but any contact with a state representative or, or senator at their office is technically public records. So they, they have to keep track of those. Um, I like to think of that as like, if, so if we all call whatever committee Representative Pollock's bill ends up in, if we call all of them and like kind of bug them and like flood their inboxes and flood their phones, it makes it difficult for them to do anything else. Um, and they, can, they can't sit there and claim that like, no one's calling us because they don't care. I'm like, no, no, we're calling you. <laughs> like we've let you know. Um, so that's where I'd recommend that. Um, it can be really scary. I know that I've, I'm, I'm more for our team at the center for when these, if and when these bills start moving. I, this is a process. Not even when the bill passes and it gets to the governor's desk, there's still like a time frame from when the bill starts and plenty of time for various organizations to file a court case against it and make it an, and do an injunction to suspend the bill until a court can review it for. Um, for the civil rights violations that a lot of these actually are. So the process is long and can be a little convoluted, but it is pretty straightforward. And I will say, um, I testified against many bills. I spoke to many legislator, legislators who I knew were gonna be oppositional um, were saying names. One of my least favorite folks in the building is Representative Coleman. Dr. Lewis and I talk about her all the time. Um, it was very scary to talk to her, but at the end of the day, I was like, this is important. And it can seem really scary. It's not, they're people. Um, frankly, we are all individually probably smarter than many of them. So it's extra not scary to talk to them. And most of the time they at least have to be nice to you because they are public officials. So if they do something particularly terrible or say something particularly terrible, that is usually from, that doesn't really go well. So, the most they can really say to you and the most they ever said to me was like, well, thanks for letting me know or thanks for coming by or thanks for calling. And that was kind of the end of our conversation, but it is still important to try and put an effort to move some of these folks because it is doable. It's not impossible, but it's not easy either, so. Well, if it was easy, we would have already fixed it. So <laughs> yeah, that's a that'll good keep us, <laughs> off the streets and out of trouble. Um, I just wanted to share one other thing from the chat. 
Um, Jill shared that there are several people here from the Maplewood Richmond Heights Early Childhood Center's Social Justice Professional Development Group. So number one, bravo for them for being there, um, but also an interesting idea for the rest of us who have connections to um, schools that are in or out of the regular public school system um, to reach out and find allies that might be there. Every district could have a early childhood center social justice professional development group and um, hopefully some of us might be catalysts for making that happen. Um, we are at our final minute. So I, um, I know that several well, I know that um, Dr. Lewis get, put his contact information in the chat. So if any of you are interested, any of you as participants are interested in having further questions from him, he has made that available. And I'm here to tell you that you can track the other two down online too. Neither of them is, is difficult to find. Thank you so much to all three of you. Thank you for everyone who's joined us on the Zoom call and for those of you who are watching the live stream on YouTube as well. And um, go out and do great things to stick up for transgender kids. It's important, they need it, and we can do it. Thank you. Ruth, did you wanna say anything in closing? Sorry, I couldn't get myself unmuted. No, I, I would just really echo your thanks. Uh, it was a, an incredibly powerful, um, powerful program this evening. I, I was very moved and um, I have spent a fair amount of time in Jefferson City and I know, I know what the hearings can be like. I, I have seen um, witnesses cry on more than one occasion. Uh, it is not a warm, fuzzy experience. It takes a great deal of courage. Um, I would encourage you to submit written testimony at this point. There, um, right now, because of COVID, they're allowing uh, people to submit testimony online. And we will try to make those resources available on, on our website when we do a summary of this program. So the links that, that were offered um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put the, pull those together so everybody has access. So as Nancy said, let, let's go out and, and, and do something positive. Thank you all so much. Thanks again to our speakers.